With the release of Spider-Man Homecoming, there are now 16 movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we're going to go ahead and rank them all from worst to best. We'll try to avoid spoiling the new Spider-Man, but be aware this video does contain spoilers for the other features, so let's get to it. At number 16, The Incredible Hulk. So the oddball of the MCU, The Incredible Hulk stands out from the rest of the series in tone, and it was also distributed by a different company. It suffers from having been released only five years after the arguably better Hulk movie by Ang Lee, which is probably why Marvel's Hulk condenses the origin story to an extended opening credit sequence. The same problem that Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice had after already so many Batman movies. The Incredible Hulk is similar to other MCU movies, however, in its plotline about science gone wrong and a superhero preventing his powers from being exploited by governments and militaries. But ultimately, the movie lacks humor. Even the obligatory Stan Lee cameo is dramatic. And yet, there are also too many of Hulk's corny, cliched one-liners. Hulk! Smash! The King Kongish love interest just doesn't work? Nor do the family dynamics between the love interest and her father hold interest. The climax is the same as Iron Man, where the superhero versus a seemingly stronger version of himself. Even one of the product placements in the movie doesn't work well. After watching Bruce Banner work in a decrepit soda factory, there's a conspicuous Coca-Cola promotion, begging the question, what do Coke factories look like? At number 15, Thor. There were some good ideas to make this Thor movie work on a level beyond campiness and the run-of-the-mill superhero fare, but in the end it doesn't entirely work. It does work in part, which is surely why so much of the Thor movies were carried over into the Avenger movies. To introduce the alien Thor to the MCU, the movie is appropriately set during its Earth scenes in New Mexico, the state of Roswell and the UFO conspiracy theories, and S.H.I.E.L.D. is placed in the position of government cover-up. Resident Scandinavian actor Stellan Skarsgård is cast as one of the Earthlings to tie Thor, the alien and superhero, back to Norse mythology. Meanwhile, other actors in the cast and the director, Kenneth Branagh, are brought in to make the silly Asgardian English and overwrought dynastic drama appear more Shakespearean. You have no idea what you're dealing with. Uh, Shakespeare in the Park? To top it off, the visual effects and production design for Asgard and Outer Space, reportedly based on Hubble Space Telescope photography, are very good. But then the movie crashes back to Earth, where we get King Arthur's sword being played as Thor's hammer and yet another unappealing love interest. Natalie Portman was great in The Black Swan, she is the opposite in Thor. Oh, and Hawkeye is blandly introduced in one scene? Also, what is with the candid angles in this movie? Some of them seem to be there just to disguise the full foot height difference between Hemsworth and Portman. At number 14, Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2 is often maligned as a mess, partly because Tony Stark is such a mess in the movie. You may or may not like it that way. Granted, Tony's health problem and his daddy issues being solved in one fellow swoop by an old film is contrived, to say the least. Mickey Rourke's villain and his motivations are weak. The character of Rhodey being replaced by another actor isn't ideal. Hey, buddy. Didn't expect to see you here. Look, it's me. I'm here. Deal with it. Let's I move on. I, I just... I Drop just, it. And Iron Man 2 largely seems to exist solely for setting up future MCU movies. I told you I don't want to join your super secret boy band. <laughs> But damn it, Scarlett Johansson kicks ass in the introduction of Black Widow, and uh, she shows some ass too. Pepper continues to be one of the better love interests in a screwball banter kind of way with Tony. Sam Rockwell isn't bad either as Tony's buffoonish competitor, and the computers and toys are cooler, taking influence from Minority Report. And current events. There's even a bit of self-reflexive metaphor for the MCU that can be read into Iron Man 2. The drones symbolize the MCU movies in that they're mass-produced copies, and control of these drones or movies are a collaboration between the often competing interests of individual genius and corporate interests. Or maybe not. Maybe we the audience are the drones, and the filmmakers are the puppet masters. Wait, no, that, that can't be it. At number 13, Thor, The Dark World. 
In some ways, marginally better than the first Thor movie, but in other ways, not. Instead of New Mexico, the sequel to Thor has its Earth scenes in London, which somewhat feels as appropriate as the original movie settings because this one has a lot of similarities to the Doctor Who TV show. There's a bunch of interplanetary travel, another Infinity Stone, and some ugly baddies known as Dark Elves, hellbent on destroying the universe for... reasons? Only one alien who can live thousands of years and has a cool toy can defeat them. And heading the evil Dark Elves is Doctor Who himself, Christopher Eccleston. Just the Doctor. One problem with the movie, however, is the Dark Elves. Why don't they speak English? All the other aliens do. The Shakespearean aliens on Asgard speak it. The aliens in Guardians of the Galaxy speak English as well. And since the Dark Elves don't speak English, we have to suffer through extended scenes without subtitles while they're speaking some gibberish. At least Natalie Portman gets to do something in the movie besides being Thor's puppy love. And Loki is back and fun as usual, although his potential redemption plotline is predictable. Some of the movie jokes are great, but others are not. The opening joke is straight out of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Others are like a TV sitcom. Wow, James friends sure are especially zany this episode. The wormhole interplanetary fight climax is pretty good though. At number 12, Captain America, the first Avenger. Not unlike Rocky, Captain America is an underdog tale of the little good guy overcoming obstacles to become a champ. Well, except minus the training montage or anything that has to do with him working hard to attain his goals, and instead inject him with a magical serum, which not only makes him super buff, but also somehow trains him to fight well. Don't tell me he learned that at boot camp. Oh, and he also learned how to fly planes. Well, kind of. The first Captain America movie also suffers from the Superman problem in a lot of ways. It's hard to get invested in a nearly invincible saint, let alone feel suspense over whether he'll survive or succeed. And like Superman movies, if Captain America works, it's as a symbol. Like Superman, part of this is as a resurrected Jesus figure, but more so, Cap is a symbol for nostalgic, good, and naive, super conspicuous hyper-patriotism. Just take it for what it is. The scenes of Captain America selling war bonds and inspiring children especially underscore the creation of him as an icon and a hero. Otherwise, the period production in the movie is good, and the adventure Nazi occult relics plotline is similar to Raiders of the Lost Ark. At number 11, Avengers Age of Ultron. Perhaps there were too many storylines and new characters and backstories and tie-ins to set up future MCU movies this time, and that's why this Avengers sequel just isn't quite as good. Ultron is no Loki either as a villain. Despite James Spader's snarky delivery, he's literally and figuratively robotic. Quicksilver isn't as good as he's already been portrayed in the X-Men movie franchise. Some of the movie's jokes only seem to highlight how PG-13 the damn movie is. Language! It finally takes a war for Captain America to curse. Fury, you son of a bitch. Ooh, you kiss your mother with that mouth? You know, because Captain has never been in a war among soldiers, or grew up poor in Brooklyn, or anything where people may have cursed frequently. No, I'm sure that mid-20th century was exactly like Leave it to Beaver. A more interesting movie might have involved Captain America cursing like a sailor, and Black Widow and the Hulk timing it so they actually met in the shower. Anyways, the actual movie hints a lot at the world not liking America's military adventurism, and here it's represented by the Avengers. There's a really cool fight scene between Iron Man and the Hulk, and the creation of Ultron clearly references Frankenstein. He's alive! Oh, and it looks like Tony is retiring again into a car commercial, just like Iron Man 3, but then he's back as Iron Man a couple movies later, again. At number 10, Ant-Man. A smaller scale MCU edition, there's no urban, global, or universal destruction. Instead, Ant-Man is a heist comedy as well as a superhero movie. The father-daughter angle and the lighter tone also make this one seem more kid and family friendly than perhaps the more violent and self-serious MCU fare. Paul Rudd is his usual pleasant and humorous self. Corey Stoll nails the comedic excess of his character and Hydra, always Hydra now. Ant-Man avoids some obvious pitfalls too. Funny long shot views of tiny action are mostly reserved for the train set fight, and there isn't much in the way of overdramatic lingering on the death of ants. Anthony! Where's Andy? Saved my life. F 
you, honey, I shrunk the kids. Manipulating children to cry over a dead fucking ant. Fuck you. At number nine, Iron Man 3. Not unlike Iron Man 2, many patrons of Iron Man 3 seem to be sharply divided over this movie. Some of this division appears to be over the movie's lack of fidelity to the comic books, but what they do with the Mandarin in this movie is brilliant, so who cares about fidelity? The message it implies, however, is a bit perplexing. Actually, this seems to be a theme throughout much of the MCU. That is the implication that the war on terror is largely an act or homegrown fraud. Like the previous Iron Man movies, we again have a corporation playing both sides and creating terror where there might otherwise be none. The movie again references the real war on terror with Iron Man's use of drones, which, just like the cell phone tapping in the Dark Knight, he then destroys. Tony, suffering from PTSD is also timely. The vilification of amputees or their family members are less so. But at face value, the movie is a darker turn and conclusion to the Iron Man series. Gwyneth Paltrow does get to kick some ass for a change, and the effects are great, again, with the added emphasis on practical effects. But I'm not too fond on the kid or the opening and closing narration device, though. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out part two of our videos, Ranking of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And as always, please like and subscribe.